I'm Eli Epstein, and I'm here with Dr. Peter Iltis, Professor of Horn and Kinesiology at Gordon College. We're presenting a short series of talks about how horn pedagogy is informed by science. I'm excited about new information that's come to light with the advent of this new technology of real-time MRI movies. Teachers generally teach what they can directly observe. When facets of horn playing are hidden from view, Teachers generally rely on their best guesses based on their own internal experiences of what's happening when they play. But not anymore. Over the past two years, scientists at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry have been working with Peter to discover what movements actually go on inside the bodies of some of the finest horn players in the world as they play. Using this new window on a world previously hidden brings new compelling information about how this elite group of horn players performs with ease, health, and the highest level of artistry. I wrote a book called Horn Playing from the Inside Out in which I presented many ideas about horn technique and artistry that worked for me and my students. These involved how we change airspeed not only with our aperture but controlling the size of the oral cavity through vowels and jaw positions. I could feel these changes inside my mouth, but didn't know what it all really looked like. I started out my book by saying, much of horn technique centers around controlling airspeed. Brass students are taught that controlling the aperture size, the vibrating area in the center of the embouchure, is the main way to control airspeed. The term embouchure refers to how we set the lips on the mouthpiece and how we use our facial muscles to control airspeed by changing the size, shape, and quality of the aperture. We're taught this consciously and unconsciously. Vocabulary surrounds how we teach. Lip slur, lip trill, lip it up, lip it down. We like to teach the parts we can see. Farkas's photographic study of embouchure's book focuses on what we could see inside and outside the mouthpiece. Embouchure is important, and there are hallmarks that almost all high-level professional horn players employ. Mouthpiece is centered under the center line of the nose. Corners of the mouth are firm. Chin is flat and square. The mouthpiece rests two-thirds above and one-third below. The question we're exploring here is, are there other biomechanics hidden from view that would help us to play and teach the horn better? In my book, I describe different tongue and jaw positions that help us control airspeed by changing the size of the oral space for different ranges. I was curious about many things in terms of these MRI movies. What do things actually look like inside the mouth when one plays a horn? Have high-level professionals come up with their own individual way of playing the horn that works for each of them, or, since most professionals have similar embouchure characteristics, have high-level professionals come upon similar biomechanics inside the mouth that are advantageous? And would this new ability to clearly see movements inside the mouth point to a pedagogy that promotes beauty of sound, health, and sustainability of career. Barbara Conable is a noted Alexander teacher and author. She said, the mouth is not a thing. The mouth is a space among things. That space is radically altered again and again by the structures that form it and fill it. The tongue and jaw are the main moving parts we can see in the MRI films. So Peter, what have you learned from this new technology? Happy to show you. Well, Eli, I thought I would just talk a little bit about our strategy in these studies for those who perhaps had not seen the first episode and maybe to re remind those who had. Our strategy, of course, was to study some of the greatest players in the world. 
with the idea being they must be doing things right and if we could study them we might learn some useful information. I just want to give credit to some of the people who participated in our study and I'm going to proceed from the upper left around in clockwise fashion to speak of each of these performers. Many of you will recognize the gentleman in the upper left hand corner here as the principal horn of the Berlin Philharmonic Stefan Dorr, a terrific player and so helpful to us in our study. Of course, just to the right of his picture is Eli Epstein, my colleague in putting these videos together. Eli played for years in the Cleveland Symphony and teaches both at the Boston Conservatory as well as the New England Conservatory of Music. To the right of his picture is Fergus McWilliam, another Berlin Philharmonic artist. To the right of his picture, Stefan Laval Jaszierski, yet another Berlin Philharmonic performer. To his Right, we have Marie-Louise Neunecker, a famous recording artist living in Germany, a terrific horn player. And below her picture, we have Marcus Mascuniti. Marcus is a very well-known player in Europe, plays in many European orchestras, and now teaches in Hanover, Germany as well. Just to the left of his picture is Jeff Nelson, Canadian brass, and now uh, at Indiana University. To his left we have the very familiar face of Sarah Willis, the host of Sarah's Music, a Berlin Philharmonic performer. And here you see her holding the MRI horn in the Max Planck Institute MRI facility. This was an occasion back in April of 2015 when Sarah was there to film along with me and with Dr. Fromm a series of videos that were used uh, on her program Sarah's Music featured as an episode called Science in Music. Just to the left of Sarah's picture then we have André Just, also of the Berlin Philharmonic. These are great players and of course they're great players so what they do and what they do physically to make beautiful music must be in some way correct. So we thought we'd study them and learn what we could. As an example of the kinds of studies that we did I want to highlight two particular exercises. They both involve slurred harmonic notes. The first is an ascending slurred harmonic exercise. And this exercise was simply reversed for the second exercise so that we could play a descending slurred harmonic exercise through the same series of notes. And as you can see, it takes you through the low to the high range of the horn, at least the medium high range of the horn. We thought by filming our elite players, we might be able to identify some things, perhaps that they hold in common as good performers that we could use to teach from. In the next slide, <clears throat> we're going to actually see a movie of our very first subject, Stefan Dor, as he performs the slurred ascending harmonic series that you see pictured here. As this movie plays, watch for a progressive upward and forward movement of the surface of the tongue as he moves from the lower to the higher notes. Watch particularly during the last few notes, maybe five to six notes. Wait for the movie to end and then see if you can draw some conclusions. Let's have a look at what happens. Do you see any patterns there? I'll bet you do. Let's look at it one more time and then we'll talk about it. I think if you watched carefully, you saw that Stefan's tongue started low in his mouth and pulled back slightly, retracted toward the back of his throat. And then as he ascended and got to the higher notes, there was a pulsing of his tongue with each note change and a progressive moving of the tongue forward and upward in his oral cavity. Now, as this slide suggests, we have to ask the question, is this just how Stefan does it or is this something that we could generalize to in all of our players that were elite? Well, let's look at the next slide. Folks, seeing is believing. So we have here seven elite players playing the exact same series of notes slurred. And although their tongues may not all have the same shape here, the general position of the tongue in the mouth is 
fairly consistent, and what you should watch for are the movements as they execute this series of notes. Let's watch and listen. Despite the fact that all of those films aren't perfectly synchronized, I'm sure you could see that in every case there is movement of the tongue forward and upward as they ascend. This is held in common. And now what we can do is we can use these films to actually extract more data. Let's look at the next slide. In this slide we're looking at Eli Epstein in side view in the left hand panel. This is an actual movie of him as he plays the same series of notes. To the right, you see a series of graphs that have been derived from data generated by this movie. We'll talk more about the graphs in a few minutes. But for now, look at the grid system that has been placed and superimposed over Eli's oral cavity. If you look, you can see the edge of the tongue actually intersects each of these colored lines. And at that intersection, we have dark area above it, light area below it. And so for each line, we have a corresponding graph over here. Dark area is the dark area, in this case, along the purple line in this graph. Purple colors match. And the light area below is the tongue. And so in essence, the edge of the tongue, as he plays, is going to move along this line, along this line, and along this line, and so forth. First, let's just watch that, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the graphs. Well, if you take the position of the tongue edge and make a graph out of it, this graph, in fact, all of these graphs have on their x-axis time, that is, the persistence of time as they play through this series. And as we look at the purple line here, the graph is telling us that the edge is not moving much at all during the first few notes, but that during the subsequent ending notes, there are little peaks as notes change and the line rises. That is indicative of the surface of the tongue moving up this line. Watch one more time, and this time, follow the graph over here if you didn't before. Up, 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 and finally up. Now the synchronization of this film is not perfect with the sound, but I think you can clearly see there's a pattern there over the last several notes, a movement pattern. Of course, this is Eli. What about the rest of our elite players? Did they do something similar? Well, let's have a look. In the next slide, you see 10 graphs generated from 10 different elite horn players. And in each of these graphs, although the early segments going from the left side to the right are not always identical, certainly during the last part there is always an ascending pattern in those last notes. This is something that all of our elite players tend to do. And when we reduce these graphs into another form of graph that looks at the movements, sort of looking at the average movement across all of our elite subjects, we get some very, very instructive data. Let's look at another slide. This is a slide showing a bar graph of the changes in position of the tongue along that second purple line that we were looking at before. The low notes start on the left, the high notes are on the right, and so as the tongue changes position, we see the height of the bars changing. For this particular set of elite subjects, on average, the first note has a value of zero because that's the original position. Every other represents how the tongue's position has changed with time going up the ascending harmonic series. And so we can see that over the first one, two, three, four, five notes, there's not much movement occurring, but as we get to the next, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, at least in those notes, we see a progressive rising of the tongue forward in the mouth. And then going to the very top note from the penultimate note, not much change. But that's about 13 and a half millimeters of movement 
And that's on average across all of our elite subjects. They all showed this pattern. Another way to think about this is to think about oral cavity size. Simply put, as the tongue rises, the oral cavity should get smaller. So let's look at a graph of oral cavity size here and see what we can find out. Again, big numbers here mean large oral cavity. Small numbers mean small oral cavity. Going from that lowest pitch up to about concert B flat 3, no particular change in cavitation. The tongue's not moving up much at all. But then going to the top notes, wow, that cavitation gets much smaller as the tongue takes up more space inside the mouth. Pretty convincing data, I'd have to say. Eli, I'll turn it back to you. What surprised me from these MRI films was the consistency and uniformity in technique as the elite group slurred up the harmonic series. Equally interesting to me was that Peter witnessed each one of them watching their MRI films for the first time and exclaiming they had no idea they were doing that inside their mouths. If the elite players were not aware of their internal movements that allow them to play effortlessly, then they were probably not teaching these techniques. Yet these techniques can be taught, and it's important to have strategies to teach them. One of my fears is that students will try anything to replicate what they see on the MRI films and may develop bad habits. I'd like to provide some guidance with a couple of techniques that are time-tested to help students learn methods to recreate the biomechanics of the elite horn players using vowels and finger breathing. Vowels are helpful. They're nothing new. Teachers have been talking about them for generations, and now we know why. From the MRI films, we found vowel sounds that mimic very closely the tongue movements that we consistently find the elite group utilizing in the harmonic series progressions. They are ha, ha, he, he. Say them and notice how your tongue moves. Ha, ha, he, he. Here we see how closely these vowel sounds mimic the tongue positions of the elite horn players. When the tongue reduces the amount of cavitation inside the mouth, the smaller space makes the air flow faster through the aperture. This makes higher notes easier. Here we have Jeff Nelson. And here we have Sarah Willis. And you can see how the tongue shapes are different for each one of us, but that the general pattern of movement is very similar. If we memorize the ranges for each vowel, we can apply them as we play. We can look at it as horn player's solfege. If we imagine singing the correct vowel on each note we play, our cavitation will be optimal for each note, and the sound will be very responsive, clear, and beautiful. So let's try this on the first part of Mendelssohn's Nocturne. Let's sing it first out loud, and then imagine singing the vowels without vocal sound as we play the Mendelssohn passage. La la ta, la ta, ti ta ta ti ta ta. Another area I have interest in is jaw movement. Peter, can you tell us about these interesting slides? Well, Eli, we're going to look at some descending harmonics in terms of jaw movements. The elite performer that you see here is Jeff Nelson, and he's going to slur down a series of harmonic notes starting on a high note. It's a high B flat on the E flat horn and you'll hear him slurring down to the low B-flat. You'll also see the sequence of notes that he plays when he does this. What I want you to watch as you're looking at this is the jaw. Does it move as he descends? Let's have a first look.
what I'm sure you noticed is that not only does the tongue drop back and pull back in the mouth as he descends, but also the jaw, particularly in the last several notes, has a pronounced lowering effect. Now because the first four notes in this series were so high and really no change in jaw position occurred, we decided to focus our graphing examples on the last 11 notes. So this is exactly like the ascending series of harmonics, but just reversed. So what we've done is we've combined all the elite subjects together again in a single graph playing the descending harmonic sequence of 11 notes starting on that written high G down to the written low C. Now these concert pitches are B flat 4 for the written high G and concert E flat 2 for the written low C. So there you go from the highest to the lowest notes along the x-axis again. And again, we're looking at relative jaw position changes during the descent. No change at all during the first four notes, hardly at all anyway. But then we see this fairly pronounced drop in the jaw of almost four and a half millimeters going down to the very lowest note. This was held in common by our elite performers. What about the reverse? What about playing ascending harmonics? What does the jaw do there? Well, in our elite subjects, let's have a look. Starting again on the lowest note, the concert E flat 2 to the highest note, the concert B flat 4, we see the jaw moving up fairly pronounced up to about D flat 4 and then staying quite stable as all of our subjects, in fact, finish that harmonic series. But remember, during the last part of the ascending harmonic series, what's going on besides the jaw staying fairly fixed? Well, think back. The tongue is rising, decreasing the oral cavity. So in essence, we've got the jaw and tongue working together to accomplish movements that allow our elite performers to play beautifully. Pretty convincing data. Watch my jaw as I play the low horn tutti from Shostakovich Symphony No. 5. <laughs> A more intuitive and kinesthetic way of learning these vowel shapes and jaw positions is called finger breathing. You may have seen my YouTube video. To practice and recreate intuitive movements when going from one note to another, we can use what I call the slurred finger breath. I learned this from Keith Underwood, flutist and breathing master, who studied with Arnold Jacobs, among others. First, empty your lungs and then sip in air as you create the pitches you want to play on the horn with a haunted whistling sound. Let's go back to our Mendelssohn Nocturne solo to see how this works. If you have trouble creating the right pitches as you inhale, then exhale as you create them. The same internal movements will result. After you finger breathe this, grab your horn and try to transfer all those intuitive inner movements as you play the nocturne. To sum up, the MRI technology demonstrated today opens a new window to horn technique previously unknown, or at best, guessed at. The elite group consistently demonstrates a way of playing the horn that's not only beautiful, but sustainable. When we use structures inside the mouth to regulate airspeed, we use our facial muscles less. We can use vowels, jaw positions, and finger breathing
to move toward healthful playing. Think of the jump in endurance you will have. Showing these MRI videos to my students with appropriate instruction about the vowels, jaw movements, and finger breathing invariably helps them play better. When students see what these movements look like, they are better able to map the structures of the mouth and then can feel those movements inside their mouths more keenly. Our hope is that this new information will help us learn to teach and play the horn in natural, intuitive, and sustainable ways. We move forward with a lot to ponder about our teaching and our playing. May we and our students and our students' students have long, healthy, satisfying careers.